Welcome to Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and me, Jim Cunningham. Hey there, Jim. John, how the, I can't be any happier to see you than I am today. I know we're both in kind of giddy moods, so I hope that carries over. Yeah. into what is going to be, I think, an exceptionally good podcast. If you only listen to one episode of uh, Behind the Page, Eli Max podcast, well, I don't know why you'd even bother, but this would be a good one. It is season three, episode eight. And in this, we have uh, a great take on an Eli Mark short story. And what else do we have, Jim? We have one of my absolute favorite humans, the one, the only, Bill Arnold. What a charmer he is. He is indeed. I think I've known Bill... Just about as long as I've known you. I think maybe just a little longer, actually. Maybe a tad longer. Not much. Not yeah. much. Somewhere late 80s, probably early 90s. That'd be my guess. Because I remember. I yeah. remember these things. I love Bill Arnold. Uh, do you want to talk about Bill? No, let's. Uh, we should do the story first, right? Let's do the story, and then we'll then we'll then we'll talk about Bill because okay. um, it's a, for someone who is a radio personality on his own he's not really a podcast guy but he certainly knows how to talk about magic and life and he knows how to make me laugh and has been doing that for over 35 years or something ridiculous like that but before we get to bill let's listen to this episode's eli mark short story this one is a little tiny bit different um a couple episodes back we listened to an abridged version of the short story the last customer in which i'd added music and sound effects with the help of composer chip Barber, we've given the same treatment to the short story, Magician in Trouble. It's sort of like a, a radio play, except uh, I get to play all the parts, which is great for me. I don't know if it's great for anybody but me, but very enjoyable. Full disclosure here, the original plan was, uh, because you'd already recorded the short story, the original plan was to keep your stuff as Eli and the narration. And then I was going to bring in other actors to play. I think there's like three other speaking parts. But as I went through it, you had delineated all of them so clearly and you did such perfect readings on it. I thought, oh, we'll just let Jim do all of them. That's very exciting. You know, of all the stories in the book we're listening to this year, which is uh, The Self-Working Trick, the award-winning The Self-Working Trick, this was one that really lent itself to this different audio treatment. So settle back, put your headphones on, Turn out the lights and uh, listen in. Here's the radio play version of Magician in Trouble. Albert's Bridge Books presents Magician in Trouble, an Eli Marks short mystery written by John Gaspard, read by Jim Cunningham, music by Chip Barber. It was clearly a mix-up. Not as bad as the time my agent sent me to a bachelorette party and sent Sexy Rex, the stripping fireman, to the Handelman bat mitzvah. But it was clearly a mistake, nonetheless. That was my first thought when I turned onto the street where my GPS had guided me. Ahead of me, I saw the road filled with squad cars. A deputy held up a hand to impede my progress and then approached my driver's window. Do you live on this block, sir? Um, no. I'm here for a gig, a, a, a show. You're not by any chance a magician, are you? Yes, officer, yes. Yes, I am. He reached up to the radio on his shoulder and depressed a button. He's here, was all he said. He then stepped back and waved me through. I put the car in gear and crept forward into the flashing circus at the center of the block. There had been nothing in the booking which had flagged it as unusual, except that it came in last minute. But even that wasn't completely out of the ordinary. Performers often ran into scheduling issues. And so a call from my agent wondering if I was available for a filling gig in a couple of hours was not completely unheard of. Once I got through the barricade, I inched the car forward and was directed by another deputy into a space haphazardly sandwiched between a fire truck and an ambulance. He gestured me out of the car and I followed, returning seconds later to grab my bag. This is the guy, 
the deputy said by way of introduction to a small cluster of very serious looking uniformed officers. The one who appeared to be in charge, a large bald man who loomed over me, gave me the once over. I'm Sheriff Martin. You're here to see Leon Pearson? The client's name was in my phone, but it didn't feel like the right time to start digging for that device. Yes, I, I think that's the name. He's been asking for you. Me in particular? You're the magician, right? Yes. Well, he said he'd come out peacefully after he sees the magician. Peacefully? Here's the situation. We think he's in there alone, and we think he's armed. He threatened the mailman a couple of hours ago and vaguely suggested he was in possession of a weapon. That's what brought us out here. He threatened a mailman? Something about being tired of only getting bills and bad news. We were able to get him on the phone, but he won't come out. Says he booked a magician, and that's who he's waiting to see. That would be you. Get him a vest. It seems he wants a magic show, so that's what we're gonna give him. Do a couple of tricks and then see if you can get him to come out. Another man pushed his way toward us, grumbling as he did. Martin, you're just handing him a hostage, is that it? That seems like a bad, bad idea. I didn't know who this guy was, but I was liking the way he thought. Look, Swanson, I'm doing everything I can to de-escalate this matter. He called for a magician. So unless you know of a deputy who can pull a rabbit out of a hat, I say the smartest thing we can do right now is give Pearson what he wants. Here, put this on. I held the vest gingerly and then handed it back to him. I can't wear that. What? I can't wear that. Good idea. No sense getting him riled up by taking an offensive posture. Actually, the vest will cover my pockets and inhibit my movements. If you want me to perform magic, it will have to be without the vest. Look, he seems like he's really on edge. Do what you can to calm him down. Do a couple of tricks, entertain him, then see if you can coax him outside. If my tricks are bad enough, maybe that'll force him out. I've been known to clear a room. They stared back at me. Got it. Do a couple of tricks, coax him outside. And whatever you do, just don't make things worse. I couldn't help but smile. If I have one mantra as a performer, that was probably it. I was about halfway across the front lawn when my common sense caught up with me. Was this really the wisest course of action? I looked at the house, which was a small rambler. The shades were drawn and no lights were visible within, although the porch light was on. Unlike the houses on either side, the front door was painted red. I vaguely remembered this design touch indicated a welcoming environment. I hoped that was going to be the case. I stepped up to the door and looked for a bell. I couldn't find one, so I knocked. My first attempt was so soft, I could barely hear it myself. I tried again. It still sounded like a very weak woodpecker who'd lost the will to live. However, it seemed to have registered. Leon Pearson must have been watching from inside because the front door opened just a crack. I could see he had the security chain on. I could also see he looked like a wreck. Through the crack in the door, I could only see one eye, bloodshot, and a bit of his face, unshaven. Are you the magician? Yes, Mr. Pearson. I'm Eli Marks, the magician. He stared back at me. How do I know you're really the magician? The question stumped me. I had certainly witnessed several situations where performers had proved to me that they absolutely weren't magicians but I was coming up short on an idea of how to prove I was. And then an idea occurred to me. I fell back on the same words magicians have uttered since the dawn of, well, since the dawn of magicians. Um, think of a card. He stared back at me. Are you thinking of a card? I said as I slowly, oh, so slowly, reached into my coat pocket. He studied me closely. 
I sensed he was poised to slam the door. I pulled a boxed deck of cards out of the pocket. Have you thought of a card? He nodded, doing it so gradually it appeared to be happening in slow motion. And what card did you think of? Finally, I detected a weak whisper. Three of spades. Three of spades! I slid the deck of cards out of its cardboard box. Well, if I weren't a magician, could I make your card, the three of spades, reverse itself in this deck of cards? Like this? I made a vague magical gesture and then spread the cards so that he could see them. He looked down at the cards, then up at me to make sure I wasn't doing something tricky, then back at the spread of cards in my hands. It appeared to be a completely normal deck of cards. All the cards were different, but one card was face down in the deck. I reached into the spread and pulled the card out, delicately flipping it over so he could see the face of the card. It was the three of spades. Through the crack in the door, I could see his one eye go wide. He closed the door for several seconds. A moment later, he swung the door open, not all the way open, but wide enough for me to step through. As he closed the door behind me, oddly, only one thought occupied my mind. Although it had gained me access to the house, I had just burned off a nice 10 minute routine. I hefted my bag, hoping I'd brought enough stuff to get me through this whatever this turned out to be. The impression I'd gotten from outside was correct. There were no lights on in the house. However, the spotlights the sheriff's department had aimed on the exterior did a remarkably good job of providing plenty of illumination within. The lights also added an eerie quality to the space forcing long shadows on the wall, like a stark blue sunset was exploding just outside the front windows. Leon waved me toward the living room, which was getting the most benefit from the spotlights outside. Furniture consisted of a worn couch, a side table, an easy chair, and a coffee table. The room was a little messy, but the key item or items I was looking for, a gun or guns, were not immediately visible. I turned to my left and could see a small dining room beyond. The dinner table looked to hold the remains of a single meal with the three other chairs set in an orderly fashion around the table. What looked like a large family photo was hanging on the far wall, but the long shadows from the spotlights made it hard to see any detail. Once I had a sense of my environment, I turned to survey my host. He was somewhere in his 40s and about three inches shorter than me. A bald spot on the top of his head was clearly in the process of spreading to the rest of his scalp. He wasn't shaking exactly, but he was sort of vibrating. He was clearly nervous. He was wearing an out of style suit coat, which hung on him poorly. He'd either lost weight or had never really grown into his father's suit. He wasn't holding a gun, but the coat was bulky enough to hide a weapon and a couple of good-sized cats as well. In fact, it might have been my imagination, but it looked like the left side of the coat was drooping down further than the right. Was there a bulky object in that left pocket? I really couldn't be sure one way or the other, so I decided the best course of action was to proceed as if there was. The coffee table was cluttered with several empty beer bottles and two mostly empty bags of chips. Leon cleared them away quickly, disappearing from the room for a moment. Seconds later, he was back. The trash was gone, and he'd grabbed a straight back chair from the dining room. He set it in front of the coffee table and gestured that the couch was mine. So you'd like a magic show, I said as I settled in really trying to sound upbeat and cheerful. I was probably overdoing it. I was supposed to have a magician before, when I was 10, for my birthday. It didn't happen, like a lot of things didn't happen. He was staring at the coffee table. I was running some possible responses through my head, but before I could settle on one, he spoke again. 
it didn't happen. And you know, I still want that magician. So I called and booked a magician. He looked up at me. His eyes were really watery. He wasn't crying, but was right on the edge of tears. I'm sort of having a bad week. I nodded. Do you want to talk about it? I'm not sure he actually heard me, but he kept talking. I lost my job. My wife left me. She took the kids. I don't have any money. I have nothing but debts. And I'm just having a bad week. I'm not proud of it, but my first thought was, well, looks like I'm not getting paid for this one. But I quickly shoved that selfish notion aside. Perhaps a little magic can brighten things up. Again, turning the cheerful knob up higher than probably necessary. Do you like card tricks? He stared back at me vacantly. I don't know. Is that what most people like? I'd been reaching for a deck of cards, but his query stopped me cold. I had to admit no one had ever posed that question to me. I had a lot of card tricks in my repertoire, but I'd never really stopped to consider this existential question. Was that what most people like? Or was it simply what I liked doing? Well, I've got card tricks, coin tricks, tricks with ropes, with rubber bands, cups and balls routine. I rattled off quickly, pushing that larger question out of my mind for the time being. Instead, I tried to think about the sort of tricks he might have seen at the 10-year-old birthday party that never happened. I'm sure balloons have been on the program, maybe a coloring book illusion, probably some form of hippity hop rabbits, and sponge balls, lots of sponge balls. I had none of those, just cards, coins, rope, rubber bands, and cups and balls, and a couple of paperbacks for a book test if it came down to that, which I hoped it wouldn't. Cards are okay. Well, since you seem to like the three of spades, let's do a little something with that card. I quickly sorted through the deck in my hand and found the card. I handed it to Leon while I reached for the black sharpie in my pocket. He clutched the card but watched my hand very closely. He seemed relieved to see it was just a magic marker as I pulled it from my pocket. Leon, go ahead and sign your name across the face of the card, just so we can make sure I'm not doing anything tricky. I uncapped the pen and handed it to him. He slowly and deliberately signed his name on the card, taking far longer to write four letters than I might have expected. Once he appeared satisfied with the result, he tentatively handed back the card. I blew on it to make sure the ink was dry and then launched into my routine. Under normal conditions, I do this modified ambitious card routine pretty quickly, getting some laughs with how swiftly the card jumps to the top of the deck, along with all the variations I'd added. However, I got the immediate sense that doing anything quickly would increase Leon's anxiety. It seemed pretty clear that my primary goal, if I had one, was to make Leon less and not more anxious. I buried the card in the deck and then gave it a tap. So, your three of spades is somewhere in the middle of the deck, right? Leon nodded as he stared at the deck. But you're a fan of the three of spades and it's a fan of you. So just like that, your card has jumped to the top of the deck. I snapped my fingers to indicate this action, and Leon actually jumped at the sound. I proudly flipped the card over. It was the Six of Diamonds. Oops, looks like I did something wrong. Sorry, I began as I prepared to correct this apparent mistake. Let's find your card again. I flipped the deck over and scanned through the cards for the Three of Spades. Leon watched me closely, his eyes locked on the spread of cards. That's weird. It's nowhere in the deck. I seem to have lost your card. Usually, this point in the trick gets a bit of reaction from the audience, an ooh or an ah, as they realized their card has disappeared entirely from the deck. Leon, as the situation had already made clear, was not my typical audience. You lost the card? Y you don't know where it is? I put out a hand to reassure him. Don't worry. I know where it is. But you said you lost it, and it isn't there. You, you screwed up. 
I quickly reached into my pocket and pulled out the three of spades. It's okay, Leon. It's right here, right where I put it. It's just part of the act. But I didn't get the sense he was fully understanding the situation. It's a common trope with magicians. We call it magician in trouble. You pretend to make a mistake, but you really didn't. It's just part of the show. So the magician's really not in trouble? Standard procedure. I always know where the card is. Why is that? Because I put it there. He thought about this for a minute, and while he did, I couldn't help flash back to the many conversations, okay, arguments, I'd had with my Uncle Harry on the topic of magician in trouble. Excuse my French, but in my opinion, magician in trouble is just a jerk move on the part of the performer. You've gone to all the trouble to win their sympathy and affection. You make an apparent mistake. The audience feels bad for you. And then you pull the rug out from under them and basically say, ha, I tricked you. I was in charge all along. A jerk move. But I always disagreed with Harry on this point. Harry, I don't think anyone in the audience ever really believes I'm in trouble. They know it's part of the act. What they know and how they feel are two entirely different matters, he'd mutter as he'd walk away, effectively ending the debate, for the moment at least. Magician in trouble. He looked up at me. He was backlit by the lights from outside, but I could see the look of desperation in his eyes. So, so maybe I'm not really in trouble? No, Leon, I thought, you are definitely in trouble, but I figured that wasn't the answer he needed to hear. Sure, maybe you're not in trouble either. Maybe I'm not. I made the executive decision that I'd successfully completed that trick. It was time to move away from magician in trouble to something that might have a more positive feel to it. I felt the deck of cards in my hand. As a performer, I'm not big on metaphors, but a thought occurred to me. It's really all how you look at it, I began, ad-libbing some new patter for a trick I've been doing since I was a teenager. I'd learned it from my Uncle Harry, who had learned it from the guy who had first devised it. I had done it hundreds of times and felt I was probably in a good position to improvise on it a bit. Cards are like life. I split the deck in two, flipping one half over in my hands. Sometimes things get mixed up. I quickly shuffled the two halves, combining the face-up half with the face-down half. I completed the shuffle, cut the deck, and then spread the cards for Leon. As you can see, the cards are pretty evenly mixed, some face up, some face down. A mess. A mess. He ran his finger across the cards and then pulled his hand away, perhaps concerned he had crossed some imaginary line. I smiled to reassure him, then squared the cards. I quickly cut to some random spots in the deck and flipped it over, reinforcing the idea that all the cards were indeed mixed, face up, and face down. But you know what, Leon? Even when things are completely jumbled up in our lives, you know who has the power to put things right? He stared back at me blankly. Once it became clear he wasn't going to answer, I continued as if that had been my plan all along. We do. We can put things back in the right order. I began to snap my fingers and then thought better of it. The last time I'd done that, it had spooked my audience of one more than I liked. So instead, I waved my hand over the table deck. And just like that, order is restored. I spread the deck across the tabletop. All the cards were now facing the same direction. They were all face up, except for one card. I gestured for Leon to flip it over. He reached across and tentatively nudged the card from the spread and turned it. It was the three of spades. Although he was still backlit, I could see Leon's face enough to recognize when he burst into a big smile. He laughed softly as he picked up the card and examined it. For the first time, I really, truly appreciated the name 
of that trek. Triumph. Triumph indeed, I thought. I didn't want to lose momentum, but I wasn't sure what I could do to help keep this positive vibe rolling. And then I remembered a variation on the trick Uncle Harry had shown me, one that allowed the spectator to take charge of the action. The trick I had just done was perfected by Di Vernon. If I was remembering properly, it was based on a gimmick trick by Theodore Deland. However, the variation I was trying to remember had been put together by Bob Hummer. I shook my head, trying to escape this unnecessary cascade of attribution. I needed to focus on how the trick was performed, not a chain of evidence on who had created it. As the steps of the routine began to come into focus in the back of my brain, I scooped up the cards and quickly counted out two piles of 20. You know, Leon, it's not just magicians who can do this trick, I said, as I tried to keep count of the cards as I was dealing them out. Anyone can create a mess, and anyone can fix it. Really? He was still looking at his three of spades. Really? I slid one packet of cards toward him. Let's do the trick together. Leon took the cards and then earnestly followed my every move, mirroring each step with his own small packet of cards. First, count out ten cards, I said, and then flip that pile over face up. Leon moved slowly, working diligently on the assignment. Once he was done, he looked up expectantly. Okay, now let's create a mess, I said. I took a card from the face-up packet and started a new pile, then took one from the face-down group. I alternated the process, taking one card from each packet so that every other card was face-up in this new pile. Leon closely followed each step as I made it, making identical moves with his packet. I spread the cards in this new packet revealing a neat mix of cards face up and face down. Leon did the same with his packet, touching the cards to reassure himself that they really were a mess. The cards are certainly a mess, aren't they? Leon nodded. I squared my packet, and Leon did the same with his. Then I stopped. This was the point where the trick got, well, tricky. This portion of the routine was very procedure-heavy and not procedure just for the sake of making things complicated. I had to complete the proper steps in the exact right order, or I'd end up making a bigger mess than I'd started with, which, under the circumstances, didn't strike me as a particularly good idea. I'm pretty sure I sounded confident as I directed Leon in the next series of moves, but it was pure acting on my part. I was mentally scrambling, hoping the sequence I was following was correct, but never really absolutely certain of the directions I was giving. Finally, we each had our packets face down in front of us. Leon looked up at me, his eyes wide in anticipation. So we made a mess, didn't we? Doing a sort of standard recap of the actions we'd just completed. Usually when I did this, it was to reinforce the idea of how much free choice the spectator had or the fairness of the procedure. But right now, I was doing it just to buy some time. The more time it took before I revealed the end of the trick, the longer I had before things potentially went wrong. We had face-up cards, we had face-down cards. Utter chaos, am I right? Leon nodded. We made a mess. And then we took some very specific steps, didn't we? As I said it, I was hoping against hope that those steps had, in fact, been the correct steps. Yes, we took steps to fix our mess. Let's see how those steps we took helped our situation. I gestured toward his packet of cards as I slowly, oh, so slowly, began to spread my own packet. Leon pushed awkwardly on his cards, and they were gradually revealed. All the cards, all twenty, were face down. I glanced down at my own packet, which, mercifully, was similarly correct in its orientation. 
I breathed a sigh of relief. I have no idea how audible it was because whatever sound I made was covered by laughter. Actual laughter coming from Leon. He was smiling brightly, first at the cards, then at me, then back at the cards. It was a mess, an utter mess, and then I took some steps and the mess went away. He looked back at me. The mess went away. That's right, Leon. You've always had the power to straighten up the mess. For a second, I was worried I was sounding too much like Glinda in The Wizard of Oz, but Leon didn't seem to notice. Leon was still smiling broadly. I can straighten up the mess. Yes, you can. I was about to gather up all the cards, but I suddenly realized the image in front of Leon, order out of chaos, was a good one to let linger, if only for a few minutes more. So, how did you like the magic show? I liked it a lot. He was still smiling, his fingers grazing the spread of cards in front of him. So, what do you say we go outside and straighten up this other mess? I tensed as I asked the question, not sure if this sudden pivot might shift his mood in a less positive direction. He stared at me blankly for what felt like a long moment. Sure thing. Let's go fix this thing. I got up as well and grabbed my bag. I decided to leave the cards where they were. I didn't want to break the mood, and I could certainly afford to lose the cost of one deck of cards. Leon began to move toward the front door, but before he got far, I tentatively reached out and touched his shoulder. He spun around. A flash of something shifted across his expression. What? Somehow, I maintained a cool, almost indifferent air. It certainly did not reflect what was going on inside me. You know, it's pretty warm outside tonight, I gestured toward his suit jacket. You probably don't need that. He considered this for a moment. You're right. I probably don't. He let the bulky jacket slip off his slim frame and drop to the ground. I heard a padded clunk as the jacket landed on the hardwood floor. It might have been his phone in one of the pockets. Or it might have been something else. I opted not to dwell on it and headed toward the door, glancing back to make sure I had Leon in tow. He was following me, but he stopped to take one last look at the spread of cards on his side of the coffee table. I opened the door and stepped out, immediately holding up a hand to indicate, well, to indicate that I was okay enough to be able to hold up a hand. Leon followed me and we both squinted at the bright lights, which were nearly blinding us. I wrapped a protective arm around his bony shoulder, and he leaned into me as we started up the front walk toward the street. Sheriff Martin, this is Leon Pearson. He's had a rough week and realizes he has to correct some mistakes. Yes, I do, Leon said. Although his voice was so soft, I was probably the only one who heard him. Mr. Pearson, if you'll come with me, We'll see what we can do to help you out. Sheriff Martin took Leon by the arm and looked to me to release my grip on the small man. I hesitated a moment, but the sheriff gave me a reassuring nod, so I let him go. Leon was immediately swept away by the throng, the crowd appearing to steer him toward an Anoka County Sheriff's vehicle. I found myself suddenly alone in the front yard, with all the attention now focused on getting Leon quickly searched and into the vehicle. With my part in the drama now behind me, I turned toward where I had parked my car, not sure if I was blocked in by emergency vehicles or if I could make an easy exit. There was considerable chatter all around me, so I'm surprised I heard a weak voice calling my name. I turned to see that it was Leon. They were just putting him into the back seat of a squad car, but he was resisting the action, trying to get my attention. Eli! Eli! Everyone seemed to quiet as I stopped. Yes, Leon? Be sure to mark this date in your calendar. His face breaking out in a wide grin. 
I want to be sure to book you again for my birthday next year. With that, he was maneuvered into the back seat and moments later, the car made its way down the block and disappeared around the corner. As I headed back to my car, a phrase often employed by my Uncle Harry popped into my head. If you can book enough repeat business, Eli, you will never, ever need to advertise. I smiled wryly. If I continued to survive these engagements, I appeared to be on my way to that goal, one gig at a time. You've been listening to Magician in Trouble, an Eli Marks short mystery, written by John Gaspard, read by Jim Cunningham, Music by Chip Barber. Well, that was fun. And it's so nice that even though Harry's not in the story, at least his voice was able to make a short appearance. Uh, Harry might be my favorite. I love Eli, but Harry is uh, Harry is special to me. And I don't know why. I think he's special to a lot of people. We had a comment from a listener that said, if you ever kill Harry off, yeah. you're going to have to write a new mystery about your own demise because we'll kill you yeah it wasn't as nicely stated but it was the sentiment was absolutely there and i'd have to look but i don't think there is an eli mark story anywhere that even if harry's not in it he doesn't make an appearance because he is so much in eli's head that eli is always remembering something harry said to him one thing that i that we discussed after we originally recorded this audiobook version of the story was I said, you know, as we finished recording, uh, that your your version of Leon Pearson, who is that sounds really familiar, and you owned up to it. Who was it, yeah, Jim? I'll tell you, uh, it's a trick that I learned from uh, a friend of mine, Lawrence Olivier. Perhaps you've heard of him. Huh. Not a bad actor, but uh, I think I've even mentioned on this podcast. You have. Olivier has always said, steal from everybody. So I stole that voice from Rick Moranis in Ghostbusters. If that so makes you go any back sense. and listen, yeah. you can <laughs> definitely hear that. Oh, uh, you plagiaristic little vocal clown, you. Yeah, that's what I did. And I'm I, I'm sorry, but it worked. And I there's a lot of people living in here. And sometimes Rick Moranis has to come out. Do you want to let him out for just a second? Not right, right now. Yeah. Can you do a little? Did you do a little of uh, what is the character's name again? Leon. No, the from the Ghostbusters. What is his name in Ghostbusters? Oh, in Ghostbusters, his name is Holy Mackerel. Do you uh, mind googling that? I one? don't. I'll, is it is listen, it Lewis? Is, it is, might be Lewis. We're we're gonna cut this out so we can. No, no. It. You keep you Google and I'll entertain the people. Okay, go ahead. I really have nothing to say. Well, you know that so many people right now are yelling out the name yeah, to they've us. They've got the name. Did you go to IMDb? I'm working on it. I, you know, these fat the fingers don't really. Pete. Boy, I think it's Lewis. It's Lewis Tully. I wasn't far off. Okay. Lewis You're Tully. Very, you weren't off at all. Yeah, yeah, I didn't remember that. Can uh, you bring a little Lewis to light? Uh, hey guys, I uh, uh, who brought the dog? Very nice, very nice. Well, uh, I'm glad that uh, we were able to put the, that voice into that particular piece. I, I, I'm really happy with how that turned out, particularly pleased with the lovely music that Chip Barber came up with. I put a link to Chip's internet site uh, in the show notes. You can go and check out his music. He writes, as I've told him, really good cinematic music. I mean, he writes songs and stuff as well, but he really, with just a few suggestions for me, I like to be a little bit like this. I don't know, kind of, boom, he comes back with really solid stuff and also a very good ear for what we call spotting in the film business where he you knows call where you called spotting it's where you spot in a movie or in a in this place in this case a, a radio play where the music should go where do we need music very good at figuring out yeah here's where it should start no that's good in the open now let's take it to here and then i'm going to end right on that sound effect just really solid stuff so there's another rabbit hole there's your rabbit hole for this episode of behind the page i don't know i let's let's call that the first rabbit hole the second rabbit hole is going to probably involve our good friend bill arnold who was Absolutely. so kind to come and talk to us when i approached him about it i said i ha i haven't asked you before because i know you're very busy and you're also very private and i don't know 
you know, I, we don't, this is not like a history of the magician podcast. We often get into a little bit of how you got started, but it's really other stuff. And he said, I want to talk about making miracles. And he knew exactly what he wanted to say. And, and so we brought him on board to do that. And then, of course, everything went a little afield. So although we don't go deeply into his magic story, Bill was a little older than most folks. Uh, when he got into magic. And it happened because of a chance meeting with one of the best magicians around. Can you pinpoint the moment that you first got interested in magic? Oh, I sure can. I had met a, a magician named Steve Carlson, and I went and saw him perform. And it was one of those moments in life where you think to yourself, I'm, I'm different something's changed. <laughs> I've, I've witnessed something that is so mind-blowing that I, I was so drawn to it. And we had just beca became friends and I loved watching him perform. And I said at one point, is there, is there any way you would maybe show me how to do one thing? Because if, if I'm at a dinner party or something, uh, I could do one thing. And he said, Sh sure. And then uh, I was able to learn what he taught me. And I was interested in learning the next thing. And then he taught me one more thing. And I guess that I proved myself to be a worthy student and he kept investing in me, which I'm forever grateful. And, and how old are you at that point? Yeah. Uh, 19. 19. Okay. And yep. what was the plan up until then? Because that was, wasn't what happened. No, I was teaching tennis at the time. Uh, very happy doing that. And I thought I'd go into business of some kind. I wasn't sure what, but I was uh, thinking that would be the path. All right. Um, and I'll remind uh, listeners that uh, Steve Carlson, uh, you, I, I will put a link in the show notes, not only to his site as a magician, but also as a fine artist. But also he he was kind enough to do a, his version of uh, Dr. Daly's Last Trick, uh, which we have a video of, uh, up on our YouTube channel. I'll put a link to that because he has magicians. He has a really good version of that that uh, is uh, ultra sneaky and really worth looking at. He's a very fine magician. He is. Okay, so Steve is sort of your first mentor and you start learning tricks. What's your path then? Well, I was very interested in card magic and I was uh, looking to try to meet this ma card magician out in Lake Tahoe by the name of Terry LeGerald. And I went out there and... I think I was there four days and I couldn't find him. And on the fourth day of the day I was leaving, I thought, well, I'll take one last chance at trying to locate him. And I found him and he treated me like I was a long lost brother. And mm. um, I said, you know, is, is there any way if I were to move out here to Lake Tahoe that you might mentor me? And he said, sure, come on out. So I went home and three or four months later, I packed my car and I drove out to Lake Tahoe and lived out there for a year. And how did you find him originally? What was what was the impetus that got you to him? Well, I saw uh, read a routine, a couple of routines of his, and he had the most lively animated patter along with his routines that I was so captivated by, and I loved uh, what I heard. And I I just went and and hunted him down and found him. And it was one of those again those moments where you go, I, I think this was supposed to happen. I, I, I guess I'm not familiar with that uh, magician. And I, I, I consider myself a member of the club, uh, loosely anyway, but that name yeah. does not ring a bell. Uh, probably for good reason. He is one of those underground guys. Um, he is unbelievably creative and prolific. I remember, I think it was Paul Harris went and spent two or three days with Terry and kind of walked away going, oh my, I thought I created stuff. And he's one of those guys that is enormously generous, uh, enormously gifted, and he probably spends 10 to 12 hours a day creating magic. When I when I left him, he was living in Reno. I think he was in a kind of a small apartment. He didn't have a, a telephone or, um, or a, a driver's license or anything. He just loved working on magic. One, one of those true geniuses. Wow. Still, is he still around, Bill? Is he still... You know, I've been out of touch with him for years now, so this will motivate me to try to find him. Oh, we're we're going to do a whole episode later in the season about mentors and mentorship. Uh, so it's great that we can talk to you about yours. Where do you think you'd be if you hadn't had these mentors? Because you had, I mean, I can't speak to Terry, but um, 
there is no finer magician that I know than Steve Carlson uh, when it comes to creativity and his devotion to being the best that he can be. He's an amazing magician to watch. Yeah, yeah he is. Uh, no, I, I had it not been for uh, these mentors, uh, there's there's no way I would have continued to pursue, you know, magical performing. Um, and then, you know, Steve had friends and I was sitting in Steve's house probably in 1980 and there was this magician in his house named John Carney, maybe I can't remember his name, oh. but he he was showing me this move and I thought, whoa, 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 how, how did you do that? That's the coolest thing I've ever seen. I mean, he, he, he taught me how to call a card. I thought, okay, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. So from a very early start, I had access to some pretty spectacular guys. Yeah. Carney is at the top of the heap, man. Oh, yeah. In terms of just, yeah. I mean, that's those are some good uh, some good formative years there. <laughs> great yeah. Additions. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, my uh, uh, sort of first time seeing you perform, perform, uh, was at the Rib Tickler, which was a tremendous uh, venue here in Minneapolis um, that sort of melded magic and stand-up comedy. Um, mm -hmm. And you emceed and hosted a lot of shows there. And I went to a lot of shows there, so I got a chance to see you. How did, how did like, being an MC and, and, and working in the Rib Tickler kind of shape you as a performer? Oh, you go, it's graduate school. I worked there for five years. I emceed the comedy club there for five years. So I was doing seven shows a week wow. and performing every week with, uh, you know, amazing uh, acts who are many of which are huge stars today. They weren't so much back then, but I remember my very first week, I, I was the middle act and Dana Carvey was the headliner. And I said to him, Dana, this is my first week in a comedy club. I mean, I've done dinners before and, you know, banquets and events as a, as a stand-up magician comedy magician but this is my first time in a comedy club and he said to me he said well do it for seven years and see if you're any good <laughs> i thought seven oh wait, wait seven years i gotta know by the end of this weekend if i'm any good. <laughs> <laughs> i got a shorter i got a shorter window <laughs> seems like a long I mean, I mean, he was absolutely true and it was more of maybe 10 years before you find out what your voice is and if you are any good or not yeah so you had essentially a lab every week seven times to try stuff and hone stuff and replace stuff and add stuff. Yeah, it was, it was spectacular. It was one of those experiences that I would love to go relive because every night there would be a performer on stage. And my favorite time was when the performer ran into trouble and I would, I would just hang on to every word as to how he got out of it, mm -hmm. how he or she got out of it. It was, you know, I, it, there was never a dull moment. I bet not. I, no. I bet not. And and really, at at, um, at that point, it was sort of the premier comedy club in the Twin Cities. And so uh, uh, high end talent was there. You talk Dana Carvey, but there were some enormously successful people that came through the Rib Tickler. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Nealon, Ellen DeGeneres, um, Dave Coulier, Jeff Dunham. It goes on and on and on. Yeah. I know you go way back with with Matt King, but that wasn't there was it no it was at uh the magic island in newport beach california mac and i were working together there for a month and uh, we were in the in the comedy or magician's condo um together and we'd wake up in the morning and we couldn't wait to get out of there so we'd go to a coffee shop and talk magic all day we had a blast and mac just became the dearest friend uh in the world to me and i just love him and that's one of the great things about this this business is the the people you meet, like you and Jim. I just love you guys, and well, back, I'm, yeah. so, I'm so proud of your work, and I, I'm I'm so glad I can call you friend. And to me, it's you know, this is the benefit. Well, we we're, we're very lucky to have yeah. you. In bless, bless, blessed. But I do have a question because you you've dropped the name Magic uh, Island, Magic Island yeah, and I too. I didn't know there was one in California. I remember there being one. Was it in Houston? Houston, yeah. And you went there as well, right? I did. Yep, I did. I, I was in the, the Newport Beach Magic Island for a month. I got booked there for a month. And at the end of the month, they said, hey, we're opening a new club in Houston. Would you like to go work there? I said, yes. So a couple of months later, I was on my way to the brand new uh, opening of this gorgeous, you know, made from scratch club in Houston called Magic Island. 
And how long did you hang out there? About a year and eight months. And that was, you know, five or six performances in the close-up room a night, wow. six nights a week. So I was working a lot. Yes. You but know, this is reminding me of a corporate event that you and I did uh, somewhere in greater Minnesota uh, for our, our banking customer. And it, it just shows the depth of your experience because you were uh, hosting a pre-dinner award show and you were doing some comedy magic and the client would come up to me at uh, the desk in the back and say, dinner isn't ready yet. Can you do 10 more minutes? And I'd say into the headset, can you ask Bill if you can do 10 more minutes? And you said, sure. And I think that happened four times. I think mm-hmm. you added 30 or 40 minutes to an act and you weren't just like doing crowd work. You didn't come out and say, well, where do you work? Which would be a dumb question because they were all bankers. <laughs> you had just oodles and oodles of material. And we joked about it later that you were just shy of knock-knock jokes. But to that audience, it was, you know, felt like all A material and you you just had it at the ready. And I suppose that just doesn't happen if you haven't had five years at the Rib Tickler and a, a year at the Magic Island and a million other gigs in between. Yeah, there's nothing like a, a, a laboratory that you can uh, take a bit in or or a, a, a new trick into a uh, environment and work it like crazy for the next two weeks, you know, 14 times in two weeks. And you go, OK, now I think I got something to work on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to jump ahead now because you, you spark something here when it comes to having a, a lab and a workshop. I got to see Triple Espresso very early. And for our listeners, Triple Espresso ran in Minneapolis for a very long time. It was very How popular. Long? How, How long? long? Uh, 13, 13 years. 13 years. Years, everybody. <laughs> and you, you made this show with two friends. Uh, they each had unique skills. You had a unique skill. You found a way to make an evening's entertainment out of that and it was a hit and it was a hit here and it was a hit Huge in san diego uh it went overseas we can get into the details of that but it was i know it was a lab for you because i would get an email or a text that say we have a new bit come on down and watch the show and i would go down and the thing you wanted me to watch was one fraction of a new thing <laughs> that made a laugh a little bit longer yeah but that was the beauty of that show and then when you had different companies running all around the country, you'd say you would videotape that and send it off and they would add it to the show. Can you just tell us a little bit about the genesis, where that show came from and what the intention was originally? Well, the three of us wanted to put something on stage that would make people laugh really hard and make them feel good about what they were laughing at. Um, and the that, that, that was the ultimate workshop because I think I did 3,800 performances. Oh my God. And being on stage with the two other writers of the show gave us an opportunity to tighten it every night. Our policy was, let's suck the air out of it or air the suck out of it. (laughs) That should be on your business cards. (laughs) Because sometimes you would tighten things up and you you would suck the air out of it and make it tighter. And other times you'd go, this isn't working the way I think it should. Let's just, you know, air the suck out of this. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we had uh, so many opportunities to to make it better and we never rested thinking it's good enough. We always said, how can we make it a fraction funnier? And then I we come up with something and I call you, John, and go come down and see our one half of 1% fraction. Yeah, and it was always worth it. It was always worth it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, I thought this. Sh- still think it's one of the funniest, uh, most delightful evenings in the theater that I ever experienced. Uh, oh, and I saw it late. So, uh, but after I had, uh, before I had seen it, actually, I was on Twins Caravan, uh, which is something the ball team does here to try to um, get people from outstate to come down to the cities and see a, a Major League Baseball game. And I was with John Gordon who was mm-hmm. the voice of the twins at that point. And yeah. we got talking one day in the car uh, from place to place about triple espresso. And he said to me, this is before I had seen it. Oh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very religious show. And I said, <laughs> well, it is. And he said, Oh yes, it's yeah. I, I, it's very religious. And I said, I, you know, Mr. Gordon, I don't think that, cause I always called him Mr. Gordon. I was never comfortable enough to call him John. Yeah. Mr. Gordon, I don't think that's uh I don't think it is. Oh, Jimmy, it is. And I said, I, I just, I can't, 
I, I don't think it is. Oh, it absolutely is. And I said, okay. And he said, do you want to bet on it? And I said, <laughs> sure. I'll, I guess I'll bet on it. He said, how about a, we're going to a car dealership. If I'm right, you buy me a car. And if you're right, I'll buy you a car. And I said, you're on. And so we got to that car dealership and I had nothing to do. So I found the number to the music box theater and I called somebody there and said, Hey, uh, I'm thinking about coming to triple espresso. And I want to make sure that there's not going to be anything in here. That's obscene uh, for my church group. And they said, Oh no, it'll be fine. I said, is the show, is it a religious show? Does it have a religious theme? And there was a long pause. And the woman said, well, it's not going to offend anybody in your church group, for sure. That much I can tell you. And I said, well, is it religious? Does it have religious themes? Another long pause. I, 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 I don't think, I, I'm not sure how to answer that. And I said, well, is it, does it talk about Jesus? Is it religious? She said, no, it's not. But it's, it's very gentle and, and sweet. Uh, and so I went to him with that and he, he, he didn't count it as good because he mm. didn't hear this. So I never got a car, I guess. It's, I don't know if you owe me a car or if <laughs> Gordon owes me a car, John Gaspard, I know you don't owe me a car. I owe you a car. Well, so if one of those two guys give me a car, I'm just going to give it to you. Here's what I would have said to Mr. Gordon. I would have said two things. One, who are you? Cause I don't know nothing about baseball. <laughs> and two, John, I would have said, all, Gordon. yeah, don't, don't know, having an idea, have no clue what you're talking All about. Right. But two, I would say, and I think I think Bill will back, back up on this. It was born in a church basement. That's where it started. Am I right well, on that, Bill? Well, when we put the show together, we we had to figure out a place to to put it on. So I called a friend of mine who is a pastor, and I said, "Any chance you would like a, a evening of entertainment for your church family?" um it's kind of a new play we're writing it's family friendly and he said sure and so 30 days later we 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 put it on his church and we had not written one line 30 days out so we, we were in a panic and we put it on and 600 people showed up and laughed themselves silly so yeah we, we did start in a church but you know the three of us are all have a, a strong faith life john gordon might have thought i did an event with john that was a faith-based event. He might have thought, well, if it's Bill that did it and his friends, it's probably a religious show, but it's not. It was not religious at all. Well, was, he's a tremendous guy and was a yeah, huge fan of the show and a huge fan of yours. Oh, how nice to hear that. Yeah. I'm flattered. Yeah, very nice man. So I remember, I mean, I I feel like I was almost in on the ground floor with Triple Espresso. I should have invested. If I was a smart person, I would have invested in it. And I remember you saying at one point, there was talk of, we're going to try to create another company and put it in another city. And you were saying, I don't know how we're going to, I don't know how we're going to do it because although there's a structure to the show, there is a point where you do your act. There's a, there's a point where Bob does his act and there's a point where Michael does his act. And then either you do, you do stuff together and to find what you felt were three geeks who could do that same thing seemed like quite a hill to climb. But in fact, you, you did do it and you found a lot of tremendous people to take over um, one of whom was our friend Derek Hughes. And when mm. we had Derek on the show last year, when we were talking about Triple Espresso, he talked about the idea that when uh, a magician is cast in Triple Espresso, they are given uh, two options. They can do Bill Arnold's set, which is, I think, eight or 12 minutes, uh, or they can do their own at that point. If the show is flexible enough, they can drop their own act into that Kiwana section of the show. <laughs> And I had the opportunity to audition uh, to play his role because there was more than one production happening. And they asked me, uh, you can either do your material in the, there's a short spot where you do a magic act. And they said, you can do a comedy magic set. And I had a pretty decent act at that time. Or you can do Bill's set that he does in the show. Scott Servine did his own stuff, right? I said, I'll do Bill's set. Yeah. <laughs> because I was then paid close to union wages to put on the skin of my hero and say his words and do his actions, completely rip him off and feel how that worked from the inside out. And it was, it was a masterclass in stillness and silence and, uh, and rhythm. It was, it was wow. a thrill. 
if I remember correctly too, John, I don't mean to jump in, but I'm gonna, he said something about uh, how excited he was to put on the skin of his hero. Mm. And I thought that's what a wonderful thing to say. Yeah. Or, and, and, or the creepiest thing you've ever heard. It can yeah, go either way. I don't know. It puts the yeah. lotion in the basket, or it's really sweet. I don't know. Yeah. And now the roles have reversed because I think Derek is just such an amazing performer, and I'm so proud of him. And uh, you know, I, I just uh, I celebrate his success, and I just love everything he's doing. And he's such a wonderful guy. And yeah, we did start originally with that. Do you want to do the set that I do in the show or do you want to do your own? Scott Servine was the only guy that brought his own set to the show. That was early on. After Scott Servine, everyone else did the set that I had put on for the show. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of the guys uh, that you have had on the show, John Lovick was in the show for quite a bit. I don't know if you've had Christopher Hart on, but Chris Not was yet. in the show. Yeah, Chris was in the show for a long time. Um, so, yeah, I went through a lot of my my comic magician friends we we had a blast and it was an amazing project what what derek said i think was so smart because what he wanted to do was to learn those rhythms so he could make them his own i uh, was just listening to an interview with laura london and she was talking about when she started faye presto took her under her arm and was helping her and faye said here's my act go do my act for a year and by the end of the year, you'll have your own act. And I think Johnny Thompson tells a similar story where they wore someone else's act for a year. And by the end of the year, they had become their own performer, which I'm sure was not your intention when you created Triple Espresso. But you did create this lab where performers could come in and kind of find themselves within this larger machine that was running. And I think that's a really uh, interesting point, John. And, and I've seen a lot of guys do the act and all of a sudden it evolves into this really beautiful version of their own presentation of, of some fun material. I mean, Patrick Albanese, I think he's done it 3,400 times. He's a great example of a guy who came in with as just a complete student of the show and wanted to be the very best he could be. And uh, boy, you know, he performed for 20 years in the role. Wow. <laughs> well, are there any other points in that show? We'll, we'll leave Triple Espresso in a minute, but it's, it is, for me, just one of my favorite shows of all time and watching Absolutely. it develop was so great. You know, we had John Carney on talking about honing things and we talk about how you honed the show. Are there one or two moments from that show that really stick out for you as this is something we discovered while the show was up and running that really made a difference? Uh, most certainly. And when there are bits in the show where uh, my character was this very nervous guy and he was mildly in, in a sense of panic where he had a brown paper bag he would breathe into uh, almost in a hyperventilating way, just trying to calm his own anxiety. And I remember taking a couple of weeks off. I had performed for about eight months in a row and I think I'd taken three weeks off and I came back and you kind of, after a break, see things with fresh eyes. And I have a trick in the show where the, uh, the, the duck finds uh, a, a card and my first night back, I went to pick up the duck and I thought <laughs> the duck needs to breathe into the bag too right now. And he did. And I could not believe the size of the life that night. He couldn't find the card. And then he wanted to breathe into the bag. And at that, at that point, I thought, you know, it's not bad to take some time off because you, yeah. you see things through fresh eyes. Yeah. I think um, I, I heard an interview with Chris Rock who said, you have to, as a comedian, you have to take time off. Because uh, that's the only way you can recharge and and come back at it. If you if you just constantly work, you got you can't get any better. It's this is what I've got, and I can't. But you take the time off, and uh, you come back with a completely fresh perspective. And yeah, so I, I, yeah, I agree with that. You you know, John Carney's name has come up a couple three times in this podcast so far, and he does talk about um, honing things how important do you think that is it just in terms of he talked about sanding things rather than pounding at something give me your take on that i completely agree with john's uh, take on that and the the beauty of of having so many opportunities to be presenting something in a live performance is i think um, you you have this incredible gift to say, what if I do something 
slightly different this time. And you're keeping your mind sharp. You're keeping your yourself engaged and focused. And you make discoveries by what John said, just keep constantly sanding things a little bit uh, more and more. And I think that's the result of a repetition uh, time and time again, little, little tiny experiments, uh, taking something and just adding a little, a little bit of a, uh, uh, nuance and that over time just ends up being this really lovely finished polished product absolutely so one of the things you and i talked about bill when we talked about you coming on the show was the idea of being in a position to always be ready to create a miracle mm -hmm. can you define what that means for you taking advantage of an opportunity that you are aware of that the audience is not that's the most simple way to put it and I think the, uh, that happened one night, I was at the Magic Island in Houston. Uh, it had been a long night and I, there was a, a, a card that got bent uh, and I did a quick card fold and put it in my right side pocket. I had nothing else in my pocket, but that a friend of mine came in with a, an engineer that he wanted to really impress. And he said, hey, do something for my friend. I, I did a ribbon spread of cards, showed him the deck. I said, think of any card. He said, 10 of hearts. I said, all right. Uh, if you would look at the deck, you you can see the cards not there. If you would now, just with my hands in the air, reach into my right coat pocket, and and see what you what you find. And he pulled out the card, unfolded it, and he dropped it like it was on fire. It, it like it was burning his fingers. And I thought, I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. And then it occurred to me, wait a minute, that was just an accident. And I was able to recall that. Oh wait, I think I got the ten of hearts folded into my pocket. Oh, I can actually make a miracle right now out of nothing. <laughs> a no skill required miracle to which this day believes it's still the finest magic trick he's ever seen. And it so, is. Yeah. So I thought, why don't I prepare for this every show? And I've, I have since done that. And what does that preparation entail? If you don't mind sharing that uh, secret. Well, I have uh, four revelations ready to go at all time. And if you happen to bite on one of my four, I'm going to produce a miracle that is going to recreate what happened that night at the Magic Island. Wow. Yeah. See, that's smart because uh, like I probably would not have taken that step. I, You know what? It would never have occurred to me. Hang on a second. I could always fold up a card and put it in my pocket and, <laughs> you know, yeah. name a card. No, shoot. Uh, that's not <laughs> the one I've got folded in my pocket. I'm going to have to do something else. But it's yeah. so brilliant to 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 think that through and go, oh, I could I could recreate that miracle. Yeah. And, and just put yourself in a position where you can take advantage of a once in a lifetime sort of miracle. I mean, it's um, it, it when people bite on those cards, uh, it's there's nothing more powerful than than a true miracle. And when people say, I have to tell you what he what he said, or, or if they share it with somebody else, people go, ah, that's not the way it happened. But it really was the way it happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> other magicians go, well, that's not even possible. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> they don't, he, he couldn't do it that. That's yeah. that's that would be akin to real magic. And we know that <laughs> yeah. uh, very great. Bill, you probably don't even remember this. But it was uh, a corporate event, I, probably in Vegas. It was probably very stressful because those events were, it was probably the morning of the show. We were, Bill and I were walking down the hall to go backstage and the CEO came by with his grandson or granddaughter. Anyway, you were chatting with the CEO and you did a little card trick right then and there for their grandchild and just delighted them. I don't remember what the trick was, but it was something you had prepared on you. And I remember asking you about that. And you said, in a situation like this, in a corporate situation, I always have stuff on me to do. And I said, well, we're going to go do this show right now. Your mind is there. It's like, yeah, I know. But my job started this moment I got in the hotel. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't end until I leave. And I'd not seen that in a performer before uh, and was really impressed with that thinking of, I'm, I'm on the job from the moment I get here. Uh, I then learned that same thing with Mr. Cunningham, who in a corporate setting is there 24 hours a day if they want him. I wouldn't recommend that because after about 18, you, there's dimension. <laughs> it's pretty salty after 18 yes. hours. Yes. But, salt, well, salty is a nice way of putting it. That's why I said it that way. But Bill, where did you come up with that idea of 
I, I hate to use the term like customer service because that's re really mundane, but that's what it was. Where did you develop that? It, it really kicked in. I went and uh, I went to Albertville, France for a month for the Winter Olympics. A client brought me in and there were so many opportunities to perform magic for these, these guests that had come in from all around the world. And I thought every time I had an opportunity to do something, even if it was way outside the time I was asked to be on, on performing, I thought this is, this is a, um, a way to create a memory. And to me, it was like, I, I couldn't wait to do it. So there were days that I was, I was doing, you know, seven, eight hours of magic because I, I would always find a group that would want to see something. Hey, I heard about uh, you from a group last night. And, you know, to me, it was just like, how fun is this? It's fantastic. It, yeah, it really that's the lesson that my father uh, taught me was if you can find something that you enjoy, you're never going to work a day in your life, which is something my father always said. So that's that tickles me that you could do seven or eight hours. And for you, it was how great is this rather yeah. than, oh, my God, if anybody says the ace of spades to me, I'm going to take their head <laughs> clean off. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Jim. My my exact sentiment is, you know, this this is a this is a gift that that I'm able to be with these people. The gift was that I could be with these amazing people from all around the world that were delighting in what I had to do. I mean, to me, it was a, a thrill. It wasn't a job. Uh, that's that's terrific, and Godspeed, God bless you, because uh, that's that's the, the the golden fleece. That's the uh, that's the the goal for all of us, I think, as performers. Is that we didn't get into this for the money. We got into this because we we couldn't do anything else. We had to perform. Yeah, and I had to laugh because at the Winter Olympics, every commute to uh, an event outing was. Uh, a couple hour bus ride because oh. uh, you have to leave the hotel and drive up to the mountains to watch luge, which by the way, is not really much of a spectator sport because <laughs> you're standing on the side of a mountain, freezing your butt off. And this neon blur goes by, you're going, Oh, I think I'm watching luge. Yes. The question is not only a spectator sport, it's, is it a sport? That's <laughs> I, I think that's, right. uh, yeah. Uh, so I would do magic on the bus. I, I was on the bus going, we got two hours to kill. And I remember a friend of mine uh, sent me an article, the Wall Street Journal in in uh, the European version of the Wall Street Journal did a story on the ways in which corporations were entertaining clients. And they were talking about a magician on a bus doing tricks for people as they were going to events. I just love this. I love all of this. Well, you know, that's something we, when we, when we talked to Mike Super several episodes ago, there was the same sort of attitude of when I'm working for a client, I'm there as long as they need me. And like you, he gets hired because he's Mike Super, not because he's a magician. And it's it's that's the thing that you guys do that sets yourself apart from someone who comes in and has very strict rules about I'm just going to do this and that and I'm not I'm completely inflexible and I'm not going to no, we're not going to do that with your CEO. And no, we're not going to do that. If you can't talk to me. You got to talk to my people who will talk to me. It's that layer of uh, you have completely gotten rid of all of that, Bill, as has well, Mike. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, you get to uh, perform magic for a lot of people that want to see it. And you're just trying to make yourself as available as you can for as many people as want to watch for as long as you're there. I mean, Jim, it's the same theory that you have. Once you're on property, work your butt off. Yeah. And, and why not? Yeah, that's the key. Uh, really, the key to the benefits program, which uh, co coincidentally, uh, I smiled uh, because that's in the story, John. Uh, uh, Uncle Harry, the story that we all listened to before this interview, yeah. Magician in Trouble, that's the advice Uncle Harry gives. You know, if you can get enough repeat business, you'll never have to advertise. Which, exactly. You know, uh, and that... I think is strongly tied to the work ethic. If if you work hard and uh, are pleasant and really give as much as you can and go the extra mile, you you will get repeat business. People will will ask you to come back because I, I think that's a rarity. But having listened to that Eli Marks story, uh, the magician in trouble, I always I, I personally that plot scares me when I watch a magician. 
uh, the, the, I've told the story about Eugene Berger doing a trick, a magician in trouble trick, and me not knowing he was in complete control the entire time, panicking as I'm watching him do this, thinking, oh my God, he is screwed up. You were putting him in front of the press. Yeah, he was in front of the press. Oh my God, he screwed up his first trick in front of the press. Well, how are we going to, oh my Lord, this old, what a debacle. And then of course he's in complete control and uh, performs this miracle that all of us were like, you're the devil. How could that even happen? (laughs) What do you think of the premise of a magician in trouble? Well, because they're telling stories and they're taking people on a on a journey the curtain opens the performer steps on stage and pulls out his deck of cards and it creates uh that conflict and the tension um i think it's spectacular um it it creates a situation where for people who don't like being fooled um necessarily they are almost delighting in the fact that the performer's in trouble mm. i mean i think it helps even win some skeptics over because they go, oh, this guy might be screwing up here, you know. I think it's a it's a soft approach uh, versus I'm the magician and I know everything, and uh, I'm going to fool you and you're going to like it. Um, so I, you know, I think it's kind of one of those little soft invitational things where, you know, if if you don't oversell it um, and make it look like oh, there's no way I'm out of the, I can get out of this thing, <laughs> uh, I think it delights people. Do you have any any versions of that in your act? Uh, well, my close up act, of course, you know, there's tons, tons of stuff that creates the, that's element of element of suspense. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you take a trick. Well, when I learned rollover aces, uh, Derek Dingle's rollover aces, I saw Steve Carlson do that. And I thought if, if I can do that, this whole endeavor into magic will be worth it. Cause it's the, the most amazing, one of the most amazing card tricks ever. And you, you, it's a triumph effect, but you also produced uh, all the royal flushes in perfect order. And I know, John, you know that trick. I, I know, Jim, you probably know that trick. Yeah. Um, but it creates this, th- This there's no way out of this debacle. Yeah. yeah. It's funny, when I was working on that story, uh, when I was working on it, I wanted to get some idea of what does a opinionated magician think of it? So I emailed David Regal and said, what do you think of that premise, Magician in Trouble. And what he wrote back, I put almost word for word into Uncle Harry's mouth in the story, except that I cleaned it up uh, because Uncle Harry wouldn't use language like that. But David's point of view was, it's just not, it's, you're being mean to the audience. You're, you're, you're trying to create a relationship and then you're pulling the rug out from under that. And why would you do that? And I tend to lean more toward what Bill was saying, which is it's all the suspense. It's all part of the act. It's all part of the retelling a story. And Stories take left turns. Yeah, I, I guess for me, in the right hands, anything is possible. So in, in Bill, in your hands, as uh, uh, you have a wealth of experience and ability, uh, you can do something. Eugene Berger could do something like that. But uh, my my gut on it is only... For the same reason that I don't think insult comics, I don't think everybody should be an insult comic. Somebody who, Don Rickles, who's really good at it, yeah, we can enjoy that. But in lesser hands, it's not enjoyable. It's 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 ugly or could be ugly. And the mm-hmm. same, I feel the same way about this premise. In a professional's hands, okay. But in my hands or a lesser performer who, you know, that that's a terrible premise because I can't, you know, I, I can't fix it if it, it, it's a terrible premise. But in, in a great magician's hand, it's, it's a fine premise. I, I want to push back on that just a little bit because I think, and I'm not a magician, so why do I even have an opinion? But I think that it's actually an ideal premise for someone who's just starting out because they think you're going to be screwing up (laughs) and you may have screwed up already on something else and so it's a nice little thing where you can go yeah i made a mistake there but i didn't because there's your card yeah if if you can do that so i I mean and that's the the bottom (laughs) i i suppose if you 
Eugene's deal was, and, and Bill, it may be your deal too, for all I know, is that I'm not scared because I've got 15 ways to get to that card. If I, mm -hmm. you know, I got 15 different ways. It mm -hmm. can be folded in my pocket. It can be in the matchbook. It can be back in the box. It can be, I got 15 ways to get out as a not professional magician, but a guy who dabbles in magic. I don't have 15 ways. I don't even really have one way. And so if I, you know, it, there's a comfort if you are a professional at something uh, that those of us who are not shouldn't attempt. I shouldn't insult my audience because that's not my thing. I shouldn't pretend like I've screwed it up because nine times out of 10, I'll probably screw it up. <laughs> it, it, it's got, you got to be at a pretty high level to, I think, to work that premise successfully. Well, and if you use the premise to show vulnerability, I think you have your your audience on your side. Yeah. If you do it in a mean way, uh, well, shame on you. Uh, but if you do it in a way that's inviting and, and invita inviting and vulnerable, the audience is all on board. Ooh, there could be trouble. I wonder how he's getting out of this. Yeah. They're yeah, cheering right. you on at that point. I like that idea. Yeah, you're not pulling the rug out from underneath them. You're creating, like John said, the suspense. You're building a story that has suspense that has people more engaged. In yeah. in a professional hands like yours, I think it's sublime. In no, my no. hands or a lesser performer, I think you stay away from it until you <laughs> get to be you, Bill Arnold, or oh. Derek Hughes, or John Carney, or Eugene Berger, somebody of that level. Yeah, that's a great premise. But in lesser hands, it's a... I I would stay away from it, but that's just me. This is probably the deepest dive we've ever taken on a it really magic is. topic. I don't think in the history of this podcast, you have never pushed back against me, which was, <laughs> which was thrilling to me. Oh my God, we're going to have a discussion. So great, great by me. I think we just flash forward and all I'm doing is screaming at you from now on. You idiot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and some people like that. So yeah, might, no, absolutely. more listeners. So Bill, before I let you go, because you've been ultra patient with us, what is it that's exciting you about magic these days? Well, I love my roots. I love the the, the way in which if you got into magic, you came alongside someone, you somehow made friends with somebody, you somehow developed a friendship, and there was a trust level, and you showed interest, and that's how you started to get into magic. Nowadays... Uh, with a credit card and a and a laptop, you can be learning any trick from anybody at any time. And I, I do I do miss the camaraderie that came along with the community, the magic community that um, would would make learning magic uh, more of an insider's game. So is that a so, good thing or a bad thing? Um, yes, to both. It's okay. it's uh, it's unfortunate that there aren't as many people that have these mentors, which I think is an important part yeah. of of magic. And there's also now more accessibility for people to learn good magic online. So I'm excited that there's going to be more magic being shown. And I think there's more performers now out there that are doing some really cool stuff. Yeah, It seems like, and you tell me what you think, Bill, but it, it seems like magic is in the middle of a, a sort of a rebirth or renaissance, if you will, that it is now, it's now an art form, I think, that we respect and are not, uh, we don't, as an audience, we don't look down on it. We, that, you know, the idea of my uncle doing a bad trick for me, and that's my experience of magic is gone now. And it, it really, Penn and Teller's show and some of the other, where we're featuring really good magic uh, has elevated or rebirthed it in people's minds that it's not just a, a schlocky guy in a bad tuxedo doing things that are not entertaining at all. It's, it's brilliant when it's good. I agree, Jim. And I also would say with all of the CGI and all the special effects that people are just, you know, exposed to all the time, they love one human entertaining another human yeah. up close or on stage where their imagination is completely spiked by what they're seeing. And it's not some special effect or some computer generated thing. It's it's uh it's right underneath their nose. Yeah, he's a he's a great, great close up magician. Uh also and, just a flat out great human being. Just a, as a nice a human as you could encounter on the planet. And he is so accomplished 
that he doesn't really have a reason to be this nice yeah, anymore. That's true. Uh, that's true. And he, uh, you know, besides talking about making miracles, which we can delve into a little bit more if you want, the idea of mentorship came in real strong. And we'll dig more into mentorship next episode. But starting out and having Steve Carlson uh, teaching you is about as good as it's going to get. I was just say the bar is really high at that point. But he followed up with some great magicians on uh, after Steve. So uh, I, I just can't get enough of him on stage or off stage. He's just a, a we tried to shoot a video together. We were cast and we didn't really know each other that well. But it was a Sherlock Holmes Watson thing. And he was Holmes and I was Watson. And they had us out at this uh, little kind of um, almost old west kind of town as we're doing this and he would ad lib stuff and i could not i couldn't my mustache kept just popping off because he would ad lib this stuff that was just hysterical and i couldn't finally the director said to me you got to get it together you have yeah. got to get it together <laughs> but i just couldn't he was so funny so i i really enjoy bill and on stage off stage on the radio off the radio he's a good guy yeah and I, I know you came to triple espresso late i came to it relatively early but as he mentioned what a lab where he you know spent hundreds of times trying stuff out and goofing around add that to the number of years at the rib tickler and he just he really has made the most of his stage time to get better and better and better and speaking of stage time getting better <laughs> Derek Hughes story about putting on the skin of his hero that's just yeah and then and, of course the reason bill came on was to talk about being able to make a miracle and preparing to be able to do that every time you go out which seems so smart simple very simple but so smart so and on top of that the i, I can't emphasize enough if you are a performer listening to this how far being a good human with a client will take you yeah uh, the times I have dealt with, uh, performers that are good people and good with a client versus the times that I've dealt with performers who are, they may be good people to their friends, but they were not good to, in that. They were too big for their britches in that situation. It, it just, his ideas about how you, uh, service a client. I, I'm, I, I start working the minute I get there, all of I, it's a two hour bus ride. I should do magic he, he, instead of reading a book or playing on his phone. He's working over and above what they expected of him. He probably would, you know, do all the Olympics from this point forward. It, uh, it's, that's the way it works. Yeah. That's a very smart way to work. Speaking of smart people, next up, we are going to, you know, Bill mentioned two very important mentors to him and the impact they had on him. Next time, we are going to have Teller. Yes, Teller of Penn and Teller. Perhaps you've heard of him. Yeah. And our friend Michael Callahan talking about the value they found in their relationship, their mentor slash Telemachus or Telemachus, one of those two. Teller sets me very straight, very quickly that the word mentee doesn't exist. And you'll learn why in our next episode. So, And I don't believe in the next episode, John pushes back against me on anything. Maybe not. I don't know. Well, you know, I don't we still we still have we still have some recording to do. We, we <laughs> shall see. I guess I'm pushing back on that I right guess now. I guess yeah. I guess I uh, it's now it's, it's the rabbit hole pushback. Yeah. Next yeah. time we're going to do uh season 3 episode 9 with Teller, Michael Callahan and yet another Eli Mark short story and Jim and I are going to try not to come to blows. <laughs> And it, it should be easy enough because even if we do, all I can do is punch this computer screen. Yeah. Uh, oh, dear. Okay. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you at the next episode. Uh, be good. Uh, uh, be safe and uh, uh, come back soon, will you? Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming. This has been Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and Jim Cunningham. Produced by Albert's Bridge Books at Grass Lake Studios. Find this podcast and all the books in the Eli Marks series at elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S 
mysteries.com. And thanks for listening. Thank you.